And it's great to um, have such a full house for this evening's event. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss a topic which I know is of um, great interest to many of us here at the LSE and, um, and others concerned about Africa in general, the issue of protecting South Africa's fragile democracy. I should say just very briefly who I am. I'm, I'm Tim Allen. I'm the head of the Department of International Development here at the London School of Economics. And I'm also the director of the LSE's new Center for Africa. The LSE has a very long history in its relationship with Africa. Many of Africa's post-colonial leaders were trained here but it has to some extent lost that connection. Even though we have so many scholars here who work on Africa, more than 100, we have rather few African students, and the African voice of the LSE has perhaps been more muted than it ought to be. And the purpose of LSE's Center for Africa will be to try and change that. And today we're very fortunate to have with us Musi, Maimani, who has taken on the very difficult role of being the leader of the opposition in South Africa. He was born in 1980. He's much younger than I am. From Soweto. He was born in Soweto. Um, and he's been the leader of South Africa's opposition democratic alliance since 2015. And that's made him the leader of the opposition in the National Assembly of South Africa since 2014. He is the um, former leader of the Democratic Alliance in the Johannesburg City Council and the former Democratic Alliance national spokesman. Um, he has a very interesting uh, personal background, not least that he has two master's degrees in closely related topics, one in public administration and the other in theology. <laughs> and he <laughs> might like to explain to us how they're connected and how that maybe shapes his political perceptions and his agenda. Um, as many of us are well aware who work on South Africa and elsewhere, religion is a very important part of African politics. We also have with us today Kate Orkin from Oxford University. She's Peter J. Brown Research Fellow in Global Wellbeing at Merton College. Um, and she is uh, an authority on aspects of South African democracy. She works on drivers of voter um, turnout in South Africa. And um, after Musi has spoken, she's going to say a few words about her own research, and then we're going to begin a conversation here in the, I was going to say armchairs, they're sort of semi-armchairs, you know, to create a relaxed atmosphere, and then we'll very quickly open it to the audience, and um, hopefully we can have a very interesting and engaged debate. All right, so with no further ado, let me pass over to Musi. Wow, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, San Bonani, I, th I thought it'd be important for me to greet the South Africans who are here, <laughs> at least in languages that they would have heard before. So, San Bonani, Dumelang, Huyanant, and uh, Good evening, and it's also it's my great privilege to be here, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Allen, for that introduction, and it's great to have a fellow South African being responding straight after that, and Dr. Orkin, and so, and I want to say uh, that I, as a South African, it is such a great and a kind invitation for you to have us here tonight. And I, I get the privilege of being able to speak to you about a very important topic which is about protecting South Africa's very fragile democracy and I think in all of that there's a lot that one could say and so in the short space of time that I've got and 
to being true to an African. I think I'll speak for about an hour and a half and leave five, <laughs> five minutes or so for questions. But indeed, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, it is given the prevailing sentiment towards, my, towards our country at the moment, I think I, it's important for me to highlight the fact that I've never been more positive about South Africa. I, I love the place, and if you've ever visited to South Africa, which I, if you ever paid a visit there, which I hope you have, I'm almost certain you would have been to the cradle of humankind, the place where so many uh, of the oldest ske skeletons and human species have been found. And I think the lesson in all of that is quite simple. It's simply this, that we've been there for 3.5 million years. We we'll certainly will be there for many millennia to, millennia to come. And so don't, if you like, misjudge us. We will thrive. We will survive. And I also make the point to say to all of us who are here, indeed, we are all Africans. If you visit the site of those great discoveries, and it gives me a very one humbling sense of one's place in the world, one sense, and also reminds that human history can often be slow. It can often be steady and painful, but it's a never-ending progress. The occasional reversal of this pattern, if we learn the right lesson, which South Africa has always proved capable of doing. I think despite our current difficulties, South Africa is infinitely better than it was 25 years ago. It's a more humane place. And of course, it could currently be much better. But I accept that equally so, it could be infinitely worse. I think as a South African, it doesn't require too much imagination to think about where we would have been had we continued down the path of civil war. South Africa is one of the most complicated and divided societies. And if we'd made a different choice, we could have ended up in one place. But I'm most grateful we chose a democratic choice, which anchors the very conversation we're about to have today, that we've chosen democracy over civil wars. And that's what really makes me positive about the future of our country. It makes it so because I believe that in a short space of time, we've been, in comparison to other African states and many other nations, we've transitioned from a poor, oppressed, and underdeveloped to a wealthy, free, and a democratic country. We've, in fact, leapfrogged the years of wars and bitter divisions that a country like the, US has had, the USA has had to endure. And we've leapfrogged centuries of, painstakingly, of painstaking and often violent reform that this country endured. And I want to say this to you. This, this is our Africa. Often when you hear stories about Africa, you can get quite disillusioned. But I am proud of our continent. I'm proud to be a part of it. I'm proud of its prospects. I also accept its pain. I also accept its difficulties. But I still remain proud to call Africa my home. And I also know that history's steady march does not happen by chance. It happens in part because of the conduct of, co of courageous leaders, people like Nelson Mandela, and their ability to inspire their followers. South Africans have, in fact, witnessed our transition from apartheid to democracy, are even most aware of what visionary leadership, in fact, does and contributes to any democracy. There's nothing inevitable about South Africa's future prosperity. And of course, it won't happen just by providence. We will prosper as a continent and as a country because we have a shared vision of where we're going and what we're going to have to do to get there. And then actually, actually getting down to the business of doing it, despite the obstacles that we may face. It requires many things, but I can't shake off the fact that the key ingredient to all of our success has to be leaders. Leaders who have a visionary sense, leaders who are honest, who are capable, and who are certainly determined to make sure the project of democracy succeeds. Our future prosperity will be long delayed if we allow any bad leadership and take bad decisions today. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, our democracy is, is fragile. But it must be protected against all odds with those who are seeking to undermine it for personal greed or, for consolid or, or in fact to consolidate their power, or very often as is the case for both reasons. Not only must it be protected, but it must be built and entrenched so that it uh, cannot be threatened easily again. That's the fire that keeps me awake 
at night. That's what I go to Parliament for. I know many of you watch Parliament and you think we go there for entertainment. But, uh, <laughs> but it's not the case. Because, ladies and gentlemen, like you, I, I, I cannot be con content with South Africa's current trajectory. I want South Africa to prosper in the long run and prove that, in fact, in Africa, we can have a working model of democracy that can show that we can have a country where my kids, your kids, and generations to come can live in a prosperous nation. A place where we can have shared prosperity and a nation at peace with itself and with the continent. I could spend tonight investing in a history of South Africa. And yes, so much of it is painful. It's a divisive history. But tonight, I would like, if you wouldn't mind, to paint at least our current context and the future that this speaks about. It speaks about what South Africa's hopes and prospects are, and why so many of you must take a closer and a much keener interest on what's happening there. Firstly, our politics have never been more fluid. I think it's never been possible to predict the future of politics, no one can. But in recent years, the one-party dominance of the ANC is something that is relatively, who have now no longer able to relatively predict that the ANC will win without questions. It's not so anymore. Their dominance is starting to be threatened. The, lot, the NC has lost its moral ground, the, the very place they used to occupy, and voters are increasingly becoming aware of the fact that this organization is irredeemable, it is corrupt, and ultimately it's uncaring. It's fast losing its support and the support of many voters who are starting to consider the possibility of voting for other parties as a legitimate method of enforcing accountability. It is a difficult and a crucial step for any democracy, but as someone once reminded me is that in Africa at first we must be liberated and then we must liberate ourselves from the liberators. <laughs> and therein lies the project that we are engaged with because South Africans are in fact making that choice. It does mean that the democratic alliance, we're starting to win more and more elections. Maybe not at a national level yet, because then I'd have to charge the LSE a lot. No, I'm joking. It's just not. <laughs> but in major cities and in major provinces, for the first time in this local government, we're about to hold elections on the 3rd of August, and the ANC really faces the, pol the possibility of electoral de defeat in several of the country's major urban metros. And it is encouraging to see how the simple mechanism of a healthy electoral competition has already begun to shape the behavior of the governing party. The NC structures in Joburg and in places like that have all started to turn their back on their leader, Jacob Zuma, simply because they are aware of the fact that South Africans are not going to allow them to have Jacob Zuma being foisted upon them. They want to demonstrate themselves as separate from the rest of the party. It's a very important thing because can you imagine if a structure of the party was telling that it's turning its back on its leader right in the midst of an election tells you that the ANC is feeling profound pressure. Secondly, I think our constitution is working. Earlier this year, the Constitutional Court issued a very devastating judgment against, <coughs> against President Jacob Zuma, finding that in fact he had violated his oath of office and the constitution. It was the case that was pertaining to his upgrades to his private homestead for the president at the public purse's expense. You know, the famous uh, swimming pool becoming a fire pool. And, <laughs> and in fact, his deliberate efforts to avoid being held accountable for that abuse. It was a profound judgment. And the real test of the country's prospect is not that it easily adopts a constitution, as we did. But whether that constitution has got checks and balances and work to hold those in power to account, and it matters when the rubber hits the road. And in this particular instant, it worked profoundly well. As the Chief Justice Mukhweng Mukhweng, uh, so scathingly in his judgment against the president, said the following words. He said, the constitution, the rule of law, and accountability is the sharp and mighty sword that always must be ready to chop off the ugly head of impunity from its stiffened neck. That, in one sentence, is the project that the Democratic Alliance is trying to entrench in South Africa. So we are engaged in a wonderful, fascinating, and incredibly important 
project in the southern tip of Africa to prove that it is, in fact, still possible to build a prosperous, mature democracy in the context of massive constraint, including centuries of, and centuries of racial divisions, massive unemployment, and a faltering economy. We know how unlikely the odds are, but we want to prove that it's possible, and I think it is. I mean, just for you guys, you can recall that last year, if you were a betting man, you certainly would have never bet on Leicester winning the league. To quote Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Let me now turn to the complexity of building and entrenching democracy in a context with several big constraints. I'm sure many of you have got your copy of Why Nations Fail, something as a, of a how-to guide to build a fragile democracy. You'll know that it's absolutely critical in the book and it highlights the nature of institutions. This point is also underscored in a follow-up work by Fukuyama's Origins of Political Order and Political Decay. And really by institutions. We refer to things like, we not only just refer to things like the Independent Revenue Service, we mean all those legal and constitutional mechanisms that are in place to limit the power of the executive. That there must be the rule of law, an independent criminal justice system, both prosecution and judiciary, the strict separation of powers and as the Chinese war between party and state, a free media, an unfettered political organization, a masculine legislature, and so on. These are key institutions that, as a politician in this arena, I absolutely agree with the nature of this framework. However, what the theory consistently ignores, or at least grossly underestimates, is the role that leadership plays in building institutions that the quality of leadership is the defining variable for young democracies, and ultimately it's the quality of leaders within those institutions that protect a fairly fragile democracy. In mature democracies, even if bad leaders get elected, they soon get ejected, or at least they are rendered lame ducks by parliament or by their courts. Americans institu America's institutions are strong enough to ensure that even if it does happen, and heaven forbid, that. Uh, Mr. Trump does get elected, any effort to, to append the US Constitution will be blocked. The constitutions must always be stronger than one personality. But in young democracies like South Africa, where personality and big man politics is often still very powerful, this becomes a different picture. It has to take visionary, big picture thinking to understand that leadership, in a, to understand leadership in a fragile democracy is about building social and political capital. It's about offering a unifying vision of the future that motivates citizens to aspire for something as a country, to work towards something. And that is not based on all divisions. It's the policies of addition rather than those of division. You need a cadre of leaders who have the moral compass to put the country ahead of themselves. Otherwise, the result is a slow descent to kleptocracy. You also need leaders who accept that there must be checks and balances on power and that the exercise of power must be dispersed in different centers so that no one power abuse can be able to undermine those institutions again. I think as students of economics, you'll immediately spot the problem. If leaders are required to set up their very institutions that ensure that their power is limited and diffuse, there will be, few, there will be very few incentives for any leader to ever do that. Unless the voters hold that leader accountable, there's no in greater incentive to reform than the threat of electoral defeat. Very few leaders have the qualities of our very first president, Nelson Mandela. He understood the imperative of building one nation from a deeply divided path. He understood that in order to build political capital and legitimacy for the new South Africa, he had to entrench the culture that it's institutions of the state that are there to serve the public, not the political elite. In fact, Mandela himself understood that even in a court, he may not even agree with the judge, but he would subject himself to it. It is, in fact, when you think about South Africa today, a very romantic idea and where, in fact, the president and the cabinet love to flaunt the outward display of power and really have perfected the art of subtly eroding the power of these institutions. 
We, are, we all see the risk, uh, of a loom, the risk looming of a king of shell states, in which power is exercised as theater merely to perpetuate the image of power. Behind the dark tinted windows is just a hollowed out, parasitically corrupt mess. This problem of leadership also captures the fault at the heart of our constitution, which is in fact a great document as it is. It gives enormous powers to the executive and to the president in particular. It is a constitution authored for a president of the caliber of President Nelson Mandela. And I don't really think the authors of our constitution foresaw that a dishonorable man like Jacob Zuma will one day arrive as president of the country. And we've learned the time-honored lessons that a constitution should be framed to withstand the worst leaders, not just assume the best. So for example, the president, not the legislature, is given the power of appointing the national director of public prosecutions. And in fact, who would have guessed that within a decade of President Mandela's retirement, South Africa would today have a president who's facing well over 783 charges of corruption, money laundering, fraud and racketeering. I mean, in that context, it would be improbable that that same president would suddenly be able to pick the national director of public prosecution who would prosecute him. It's tantamount to asking a Tsotsi to pick its own police person. <laughs> For those who are not South Africans, the word Tsotsi means criminal. Thought I should help there. But President Zuma has systematically led an assault on our democratic institutions during his term of office. Much of this assault has been aimed at keeping himself out of court and in fact out of prison. But there is a growing weight of evidence to suggest that the state is being widely captured to enrich his friends and his family. For example, the rule of law requires that the court judgments always be obeyed. But recently, we've had the absurdity of the president and the national director of public prosecutions being in contempt of an order of the Supreme Court. The head of the specialist investigative unit called the Hawks in South Africa, who's also appointed by the president, a certain Mr. General, uh, General Burning in Tlemeza, recently said, literally without a hint of shame, that an adverse judgment is merely the judge's opinion. As journalist uh, Sam Mkokeli has, has argued, the appointment of completely incompetent and obviously unfit people to positions of great responsibility is no mistake. It is a deliberate ploy to subvert the public service so that the master's will may be done. That, ladies and gentlemen, I believe is an assault on the institutions right up close. And by state capture, Jacob Zuma is still reversed is still reversible in South Africa. Some institutions, and most notably the judiciary and the public protector and advocate Dulima, Tulima Donzella, have shown remarkable resilience and independence, despite all the efforts to rein them in. And recently, the Constitutional Court in a landmark ruled that the independent electoral commission had failed to meet all requirements of holding a free and fair elections, and free election, giving it 18 months to comply fully with that constitutional ruling. So we know exactly where the weak spots are coming from. And we will be monitoring the forthcoming elections to ensure that there are no irregularities. And that, in many ways, is part of the job of ensuring that we can safeguard our democracy. Because I think, ladies and gentlemen, in the end, the most important check on power is, in fact, the voters. And being the leader of the Democratic Alliance gives one a fairly unique perspective. We are no longer just a party in opposition. We're a party of government in a metropole and now in 30 local municipalities in South Africa in four provinces. The governments we do run, we won with every slender majorities that have been since built up through a hard slog. We know who our masters are in this instance, and it's every single voter and every single complaint, which I often have the personal duty of receiving them in the middle of the night <laughs> without any thanks, but we recognize that that is absolutely important. It is a fundamental point of democracy. That's why, and, and therefore the question is, why do incumbents and those who hold political power 
have weak incentives to curb their own excess, build a state, and deliver to the voters. It is exactly why. And well, incentives in a democracy are called accountability. And accountability is enforced only through the ballot box. The prerequisite for any successful democracy is that voters understand that they can and they must use their power, the power of their vote to dish out punishment to those who are corrupt and choose a new government. And that's why I believe I still remain optimistic about South Africa, for that's where our greatest hope lies. Now let's consider, in fact, some of the constraints to successful democracies that literature identifies, spe specifically in ineffective state and in a fragile economy. It is often a common feature of young democracies, especially in societies with high levels of poverty, that the capacity of the state to actually deliver on its mandate is quite weak. Here, I believe the DA is showing to the people of South Africa what is possible by building a capable state where we govern and even at provincial and local level. We do this by rejecting the politicization of the public service that has come to define the, AN the ANC and by giving public employees positive motivation, motivation centered on excellence and service to the public. In short, we are working to professionalize the public service. All employees in whatever field want to be part of an organization that exudes a sense of purpose and excellence. We want to make it clear that we want to deliver the best services. We want to be the friendliest, most responsive, and most professional civil service. We want all dear politicians and all civil servants in dear governments to follow the ethos that says, we will serve the public and the public does not serve us. And we do. I mean, my, my sister works for the police, just as a side issue. And often she even has to fight for little things like getting toilet paper in the bathroom where she works. These are small things that don't exude excellence in the public service. And we're working hard to ensure that that becomes a place, an ethos, and a culture in the governments that we run. We do focus on rooting out corruption and throwing open, uh, and throwing open the doors and windows of government with total transparency about expenditure of public money and awarding of contracts. We are the only government, for example, that has passed legislation where, where we govern to ensure that people who work for the state don't benefit from, business, uh, from businesses that do business with the state. This is a conflict of interest and is often the root of so much corruption in South Africa. We also cannot, cannot hope to build a capable state without improving public education. Education in some of the rural parts of South Africa is amongst the worst in the world. Where we govern, we're steadily improving the quality of public education, especially for poor South Africans, by focusing on a few very core inter interventions. The quality of teachers, the quality and accessibility of textbooks, school attendance by learners and, believe it or not, teachers alike, and also using inf information technology in education. Another major constraint to our fragile democracy uh, is, is our fragile economy. Fragile in the sense that it's very susceptible to economic shocks, but also in the sense that the crisis of unemployment in South Africa threatens to triple over the entire democratic project. Economies from time to time face shocks, external shocks, natural disasters, and internal shocks. The fundamental question for any economy is how do you handle those respective shocks? In South Africa, over recently, We've had all three respective shocks. We're still mainly an exporter of raw commodities, and the global commodity slum has hit us hard. We're also currently suffering through the worst drought in nearly a century. And finally, we're, staying, we're still trying to recover from the internal shock of the ANC's complete mismanagement of economic policy, typified by the President disastrous Graham of musical chairs with finance ministers in December last year. And interestingly so, the data on economic shocks and democracy shows how the lowest reduction in GDP happens in those countries where democratic institutions are strongest, where constraints on executive power are strongest. South Africa's lack of economic resilience threatens our entire project our entire national project. Unemployment in South Africa is so high and rising that it threatens to undermine the legitimacy of our democratic government. 
increasing unemployment and poverty adds to the feeling of economic exclusion that so many South Africans still feel. And with a sense of exclusion comes the increasing anger of con and conflict, anger which can be easily exploited by populists and demagogues to mobilize support. The sense of economic dis dislocation is fanning the incendiary, uh, incendiary rhetoric by populists across the globe. Let me just grab some of this water. Just to... Sorry. I mean, I think uh, this is epitomized by the incredible rise of people like Donald Trump, who is the nationalist messaging of, in fact, the Leave campaign, and I won't get into that here in Britain, <laughs> and the rise of Marxist-Leninist and far-right movements at home and elsewhere. These are all symptoms of politics that tap into the public's anxiety without the luxury of facts and reasonableness. This, in turn, makes peaceful and cooperative labor relations increasingly difficult. This is an arena that is commonly listed as a major obstacle to investing in South Africa. It does not help that, growing, that, that governing politicians commonly abuse the business community and actively break down whatever co cooperation exists. It is true that South Africa's labor policy needs reform, but it also just needs a government that is committed to the politics of nation building. We understand that you simply cannot develop an economy and create jobs without proper, modern private sector that is attractive to investors. No good can come from vilifying and alienating the private sector with defunct uh, Maxis rhetoric. Uh, the business community is an essential partner in a democratic project. And again, we want to bring more people on board. We are a party of addition, not division. Add to this the very, the very real legacy of racial exclusion in South Africa that still defines the life chances of so many people. In simple facts, the face of poverty in South Africa is still black, and that economic op opportunities and, partici and participation is still very skewed on racial lines. And that's why it is essential that we focus not only on the growth imperative, but we are also undoing the racially exclusive structure of economic opportunity. This, in fact, involves helping black South Africans to get on the first rung of the ladder of asset accumulation that is critical for breaking down the cycle of intergenerational poverty. It's what De Soto, the De Soto wrote about when, uh, and what was tested in a small scale in South America. We're doing in large scale where exactly we govern, making sure that urban, poor, black South Africans have title deeds to properties where they live. So far, our governments have put tens and thousands of property titles in people's hands. Restorative programs, inclusive ones, programs of redress have been captured by the new political elite. Those who are in the ANC who are connected to this project does not mean they are unnecessary. It just means, like policy posture, they require a capable state, the rule of law, and, transform, uh, and, and transparency. Land reform programs must mean land allowing for farmers to prosper but also can be a key driver to job creation in the near horizon. I mean, for me and my hope, my personal story is I'm a child who grew up in Soweto. We didn't have much under the apartheid government. Yet, post-1994, we were able to gain title to our own land. And when we did that, we could, in fact, go to the bank and say, we will use this asset if you're willing to give us money to educate this little one. So I'm grateful today I have two master's degrees, but it is a function of having those particular assets being put in the hands of ordinary South Africans. So where the deer governs, we are in fact trying to model a vision for South Africa by building a much more inclusive economy that extends opportunities to black South Africans and that in fact, at that economy that is more resilient. And again, the link between these two factors is unavoidable. New investment is attracted to legitimate governments where the rule of law works where corruption is, minim minim is minimized, where the public service is professional, it quickly becomes a virtuous circle that results in unemployment being significantly lower where the DA governs and economic growth being significantly higher. So ladies and gentlemen, 
We are, in fact, trying to diversify the economy by attracting investments in places like green energy, agri-processing, tourism, and manufacturing. We're trying to build closer economic and trade links with our, our member states, such as and other African states, especially in the SADC region, following a trend in favor of greater integration and unity across the globe. And except perhaps here in the UK, where I sincerely hope the public will choose unity with sovereignty over isolationism. It's not a campaign message. I just <laughs> Friends, and just in conclusion, I want to affirm that we take it as a great privilege to be part of this extraordinary experiment in South Africa. We are a young and a fragile democracy. And we are, we, and like we face all, all the threats and all the constraints that other fragile democracies face. And we face a few unique ones of our own. But we are tackling these constraints head on. We must and we do reject the politics of bitter racial divisions. We reject the idea of achieving change through violent means. We believe the most powerful weapon is still the ballot. We're absolutely, I am giving my life to building a nation that is united, that is prosperous, that thrives under the rule of law with a capable state and a growing economy. The battle to maintain these principles is a never ending one, but we know there is so much at stake. This is our democracy and we'll fight to keep it both from kleptocrats and ideologues. We're absolutely devoted to modeling that alternative way we govern and by winning more municipalities through peaceful democratic means which are always the ballot box. That is in fact the purpose of our everyday effort. And increasingly, and I'm glad to say this, that many more South Africans are receptive to our message. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm more optimistic than ever before about the future of our country. And I believe it is indeed the best way to safeguard our fairly fragile democracy. I want to thank you so much for your time. Much <laughs>
don't believe that anymore. And I think, um, and that's the third thing I'll say, is that a lot of this is because people don't trust parties and politicians. Although there's some uh, recent encouraging evidence that people now trust both opposition parties more than they trust um, the governing one, um, I still think there's, you know, there's a real big challenge that we need to throw down as citizens. So think of me as a kind of aggregator for the voices of thousands of people that we've spoken to over the years. And let's get into some numbers. So the first thing is to say, you know, we in comparison uh, to the rest of Africa are really strong believers in democracy even though we've had it for a lot longer than other places. So what this, this graph shows you is what, uh, this is from the Afrobarometer, it shows what citizens in four countries think the primary purpose of government is. So there are two options. You can say either it's more important to have a government that can get things done even if we have no influence on it, um, that's statement one, or you can say it's more important for citizens to be able to hold government accountable, even if that means it makes decisions more slowly. And so South Africa, despite the fact that it's been a democracy for a lot less long than many of these other African countries, is a real believer in the fact that we need to hold our government accountable, even if it means that things are sometimes slower and more painful. We've heard a lot about the born freeze and why they don't care. Um, so we are not only people who value democracy, we also keep going to the polls, despite the fact that, um, you know, among many other African countries, we haven't yet had a large scale change in government. I think one of the things that's really not commented on is that local elections participation has actually increased um, quite dramatically since 2000 and on the, on, the on the most recent polls is likely to increase again. So, you know, we really are with great dedication keeping on going to the polls. And although youth participation is a problem, um, you know, we, this graph here shows that the blue people, so those are people in, in our demographic, those who are 20 to 29, are registered and are voting at much lower rates than the red people, um, who are those over 30. Um, this has been a problem for a long time, and this, this kind of indicates that, that um, people in, in this demographic really have struggled with whether their vote actually means something and is achieving anything. And the final um, sort of argument for the fact that citizens value and use democracy is one that I think opposition parties are increasingly excited about and the governing party is increasingly worried about is that South Africans actually change political allegiance quite often. Um, so this graph is from the latest Ipsos Mori polls that just came out in three of the big metros. And what's that, what that's showing is that from um, the orange bars, the, um, which were the, how people voted in 2014, a lot of people have actually changed the way that they want to vote. So you can see there's a big decline in support um, on the yellow and green bars for um, the ANC and a large increase for both the Democratic Alliance and the economic freedom fighters. And what's finally interesting to see here is that a lot of South Africans are not, it's not that they're switching allegiance one way or the other, um, it's that many of them actually say, I don't know, you know so these are, this is a nationally representative survey in 2014 and 2015, um, people are saying, you know, either I don't know which party I support, I don't have a core party, or um, in the purple, I'm a swing voter. And so that actually adds up to al almost 40% of our electorate do not have a core allegiance to one or another party. So I think what that's saying is that many South Africans are kind of coming to the table of democracy. They're voting, they're turning out in both local and national elections, and you know, they're taking the time to engage with political parties and really think about who they want to support. However, I think you know, the big thing that I showed you on those first graphs is that one of the big groups of people who don't believe that are young people. And they're, voting at they're registering and voting at much lower rates than other people are. And what our research starts to indicate is that we, we really are not, or have not since the beginning of democracy, taught young people um, about why going to the polls matters. So we did some research in um, Johannesburg over um, last autumn, and we spoke to 3,000 young people, and we had a conversation with them, a 30-second conversation. Um, so we, we, we took 3,000, um, we broke them in half, with, 30, with um, half of them, we, we just did a short survey, and with the other half, we gave them a short message um, about why they should be registering and, and turning out to vote. 
And what this graph shows, so we gave a number of different messages, which are, um, you know, we gave all sorts of different topics, but basically it shows that a simple 30 second conversation with a young person made that young person six percentage points more likely to turn out to vote than if that conversation hadn't happened. So that's a surprisingly large result for a very short conversation. And what was surprising to us is, you know, in, we then asked, has anybody had this conversation with you before? And although these were people in Soweto, so it's one of the most highly targeted and politicized areas of the country, very few of the people that we spoke to had had that conversation with a parent, with a politician, with anybody. Nobody had, was speaking to young people about why their vote counted and how they could use their vote to make a difference. And so I think although um, older people really believe, you know, are really going to the ballot box and are turning out and believe that democracy matters, young people haven't learned that. We're not teaching them in school. Um, and, you know, they really are ripe for that kind of education. And then the final point I wanted to make was also from a, um, from a survey that came out recently. And this, in comparison to other African countries, basically shows in some that People do trust the electoral process. They believe their votes are important. But they're very dissatisfied with democracy, and they often believe that whether they vote doesn't make a difference, and that um, all parties are the same after the election, so that voting is pointless. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions in relation to the speech that was given to ask why voters should think any differently from the perceptions that they've, they've given to pollsters. You know, what is it? Um, from the DA's perspective in particular, that means that they, that, you know, the Democratic Alliance or other political parties should be trusted. And so I had three questions in response, in direct response to the speech. The first was to ask, you know, given the numbers that I've presented, what is the DA doing to turn out, encourage, educate those young people and others who are opting out of the system? A controversial perspective might suggest that a, a smart strategy for a political party is just to turn out your base and avoid the young angry voters who might do unpredictable things um, to your polling numbers. It's a difficult conversation to have, but I would be interested in what the DA's strategy in particular for young people and others who are angry with the system is. The second question, and I didn't show these numbers, um, but a lot of the success that's come out um, for the DA um, and other opposition parties in the polls has been in, in urban areas. So the polls that came out that I just referred to were in PE in Johannesburg, um, in Chwane. A lot of people say the DA doesn't win in rural areas because at core it's not a social democratic party, it's a liberal party. It doesn't have a plan for land necessarily. It doesn't have a plan um, for getting grant recipients into asset ownership because at core it doesn't believe in redistribution. So the controversial question is, why should people in rural areas vote for and trust you? And then the final question, and I was instructed to be provocative, <laughs> is, you know, the DA speaks about good and capable governance, but many of the voters who are most mistrustful are, th are those in places where governance is poorest, and they don't believe the Western Cape experience speaks to them. I spent two months in Toyandu in Venda last year, and I can understand why. You know, what does the DA have to offer um, in terms of governance lessons for places that are patrimonial, corrupt, bankrupt, and lack, lack skills? What, you know, what plan does the DA offer um, those sorts of municipalities? So with that, I think with those three questions, I think I'll throw down and we can start the conversation. very much for that. You've already started with some very provocative questions. Oh, it doesn't feel like an armchair conversation <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm glad I'm sitting between you. Um, <laughs> and then you have to ask her a really provocative question as I well. I think I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. <so. laughs> yeah, now you're on. Then. All right. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, I find, I find that very 
insightful and very consistent with certainly our own internal polling that we're starting to see. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I think it seems to work. Is it? Yeah. P put your hand up if you can't hear. Yeah, no one. Oh, there's a guy at the back <laughs> there who's, who's raising a complaint. <laughs> I can't do too much about the heat. It's part of my gift from South my, Africa. Yeah, <laughs> jacket off, my jacket off. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> look, the, the question about turnout is, is, a, is an absolutely important one in terms of what are we doing to, to make sure we engage young people. I think there's both the messaging towards young people and, in fact, the actual delivery for young people. Here I am, a 36-year-old leading the opposition in South Africa. I think there's a part of that that models to South African young people that you can make it to the top in the organization. And Jordan, who's right here, is uh, my chief of staff. He also is a member of parliament in his own right. He was the youngest MP for a state, for, for a stage in when he started off. Indicates the fact that young people can join our organization and get to the top. So there's a part of us that's saying, Look, we don't pay lip service to saying young people can lead one day. We actually do put material uh, opportunities for them that they can exploit. But the second issue is the fact that part of what's been a challenge is that I agree with you. Political parties have, a, have, have an element of pragmatism to it. It's not that we fear what young people are going to do. It's that at this current stage in time, they represent a small percentage of people who are registered to vote. So when you go and invest significantly in people who are not registered to vote, they can't vote when they get there anyways. So your, the better question perhaps will be, what are we doing to make sure they are registered, which is the first piece of work that we've got to do, and we're doing quite a bit of work. What platforms do young people find themselves in across the country? And, and we have a much bigger mass mobilization on the ground than we've ever had before. It doesn't discriminate on the basis of age. It goes out house to house to make sure we can meet as many people as possible. But I think as a party, we're fairly innovative about what we do online, on social media platforms, whether they be Facebook, Twitter, and all of that kind of stuff. And I do my own tweets just because we don't even use, uh, it's a crucial tool for me to engage young people. And they say some fairly worrying things to me, but you've got to, <laughs> <laughs> you've got to take it and, 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 and live with it. It's part of the accessibility that we give to young people. Could we do more? I, I completely agree with you. We could do more. Uh, and certainly it will be a project that I'll be engaged with between now and 2019 to make sure we are at universities, we're at colleges, we're at schools, to make sure we engage young people. Your, your second question about uh, our growth being primarily in urban, in, in urban areas and not one, there is, a, there is a, a really genuine pragmatic reason to that. Urban voters, urban voters read newspapers, they engage media, so it makes it easier to get your message to them. Rural voters are in sparse areas, so you need the manpower to be able to walk to get to them. That's the first thing. The second thing is South Africa has a cocktail of traditional leaders, so you've got kind of like Republican in the in a governing sort of way and traditional leadership on another end. So I'll give you a, a very practical example. Sometimes I go and I meet traditional leaders who say to me, yeah, Mr. Maimani, we take your message, we agree with you. Can you come and speak to our people to, to give them t-shirts? I said, of course I'll happily do that. And then the traditional leader, when I walk away, says to me, says, but Mr. Maimani, I want to remind you that in a few weeks' time, the president will arrive here and give me an ML500 vehicle you're never going to match that. So, so you're up against patronage in fairly in those communities. I haven't given up hope, though. I think, I think we are growing in those communities, certainly in rural Transkar. When you get there, the issue here is that if you can govern a city in a province, because of remittances and just the way the basics provincial economics work, you govern well in a city, you provide opportunities for more people, that message gets to rural communities in a very effective way. So, yeah, it might seem like it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's too long, but it is an important strategy to demonstrate in government what you can do. And I think on the policy discussions, I, I, I don't often, I, because I think even the conversation about land reform is a different one, because I think, particularly in rural communities, you find that people live with traditional chiefs who eventually tell them that, look, um, how can we, how, how, 
the, the, the disbursement of land often is in the hands of the traditional leader. So even if our policy is to focus on individuals and say to them, let Makumalo, or the lady who lives in that village, own the land, it becomes very difficult in a world where sometimes traditional leaders take control of that. So it can get very tricky. But in this instance, I think it's about reach. It's about access to those voters. And quite frankly, when I look around, in a world where even the person who's living without land, the one appreciation they've got is the fact that they are without work. And I think the election, certainly between now, this election more critically, and the one in 2019, will be just on three things. Jobs, 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 if I could say it that way. Because mm. I think that's going to be the key focus going forward. Look, your third question about the fact that many people say the Western, ex the Western Cape experience doesn't speak to me. Actually, maybe is linked to the, f to the second question. The experience... The understanding of constitutional framework in South Africa sometimes is not something that we can take for easy for granted. So often, I'll arrive in Toyando and the people, of, which is another province, well, Limpopo is another province in South Africa, so totally different from the Western Cape. I get there and the people say to me, Mr. Maimani, why don't you come and deliver for us first and then we'll vote for you? <laughs> and therein lies some of the dilemma. Because you've got to say to the voter, no, 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 you've got to vote for me first before I can deliver for you. So, and then the other thing is that you often, people give us their reflection, but you care about the people in that province. And we kind of go, if you vote for us here, you can taste the difference. So, 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 so we've got to do a lot more, whether in schools, whether in entrenching constitutional democratic processes, in educating people about how, in fact, the machinery of the state works and what it does. But I also do think that uh, it should not be presumed. I mean, I think, what do people go to the polls to express? They go to the polls to express a number of different things. Some of it is history. Some of it is identity. Some of it is the fact that they've had contact with somebody who comes from a different party. And I think, for me, the more there's better penetration of media, be better penetration of access to those people, we're starting to see that trajectory turn. So in this particular instance, I think politics all over the world, I'd swear if I sat with Americans, they'd say, you can argue the fact that America has done well, but I don't see myself in that picture. What, is, cannot, what cannot be debated currently in South Africa is the fact that many people are saying, we were promised much in 1994, we started to make progress, and now in fact we're starting to see that progress being undermined. We're without work, and we've been disappointed by the ANC. One of the best things, and I know you didn't ask me this question, but one of the best things that's happened to South African democracy at the moment is that once you include the EFF, it's introduced a very profound sense of choice. It says to people that the previous choices were like apartheid or freedom. That's not a choice. <laughs> right? So it's natural that you pick one. But today, I think people are going, wait, hold on. I can choose between the ANC's model of governance, which is corruption, patronage, or I can choose this party. I can choose the DA, clean government. Already we're seeing a lot of uh, unrest in service delivery protests, which I'd like for you to comment on as to what do they mean in relation to voter turnout and participatory democracy. But without doubt, the people of Vuani, which is a community in Limpopo, the same province you refer to, have taken to the streets to say we have a dissatisfaction with the ANC. And one of the things that was most encouraging for me is that those same councillors then picked up the phone, called me and said, Mr. Maimani, we're sick and tired of what the ANC is doing. Would you be able to come and see us? They are in a rural community. They are in uh, the same climate that I've just described. So I do think the biggest introduction that's happened to South African politics in the last while is that there's an introduction of choice, and that choice is no longer black versus white or black party, white party. I think now, more succinctly, people are starting to go, it's a choice between the ANC versus the DA. And the only card the ANC plays and wants to keep playing is to say, but no, it's a choice between black and white, which is becoming less and less true. So perhaps maybe you can assist in the question about how do, we, how do we incorporate the discussion about service delivery and where that goes? That was your provocative question. Oh, no. It's actually quite a gentle one, I thought. Is there a, is I, I thought so, but yeah. I, if you want me to provoke, yeah. I'll get on to it. <laughs> yeah. 
Is it? So in response. Yeah, I think you're on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in re you know, what does what does protest mean? Um, I, w I would say two things. Uh, the one is that, uh, so the Institute for Security Studies has just done an interesting study saying that actually, very, uh, you know, there, there are a large number of violent protests, but there are fewer violent ones than we think they are. If the police were better trained, and you know, now the police minister has, has started to make some steps in that direction, we would probably have, have fewer um, violent protests. I think there are a lot of protests. I think it's because you know, South Africans have learned over many generations that protest worked. It brought down a government. Um, and I think it's, it's a harder and longer process to learn about why voting works in getting you what you want. And that's a deep sadness in, in our country, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, as, as um, I think Johnny Steinberg said, uh, you know, sometimes Latuti House only comes when they see smoke. Um, I think there is a, is a real sense that any, any elite figure only pays attention when there's a protest and that, that works. Um, yeah, which may be a simple answer, but I, I think is one of them. Um, you asked about, uh, you, you know, you spoke a lot about rural areas. And I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I recognize the realism and incrementalism of the DA's approach. And I think a lot of people applaud that. It's a sensible way to go. Um, but just to push you a bit on, on rural areas, so, uh, you know, in this, this field site we were working in, in, in Venda, it did seem like a lot of young people were on Twitter and Facebook, and they were very, you know, there was, there was no difference in their level of political information from those youth in, in Soweto or on the East Rand that we interviewed. Um, but their argument was that, by and large, for people in rural areas in particular, the ANC's been pretty good. You know, they've got grants and they've got public works jobs and those weren't there before. Um, and they, they were saying, we don't know what either of the EFF or the DA would do for us because we don't believe jobs are ever going to come here. No one we know has a job. Um, and so, yeah, so I would push you a little bit on, on what the policy platform is um, for those sorts of areas that's going to, you know, if, maybe if, if grants and public works were the cheap wins, what's the next step? Sure. Mm. Maybe before you come back, on that, maybe I'll put it out into the audience. Has anybody got any questions now? Oh, lots of questions. <laughs> so shall I, take, shall I take a group of three questions? And can I ask you to be succinct? Because we've only got about, say, half an hour or so. Um, let's start right up at the back. Hi. Um, I'm, um uh, master's student of Department of Management. My question is to uh, Mr. Musi Maman, that you mentioned somewhere in the speech that, uh, that uh, politicians who were liberators of South Africa, the nation had to be liberated again. Absolutely. Uh, can no. you hear me? Say, can you just say it again? Okay, you mentioned somewhere in your speech that politicians who were liberators of South Africa the nation had to be liberated again, has to be liberated again. Okay. And liberated okay. twice, okay. yeah, liberated from the liberators, okay. was that the phrase, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so how would you make sure once you are in power, your party is in power, that the yeah. politicians would not say, make the statement which you just made? Yeah, <laughs> so how will, you stop, how will you stop yourself from becoming corrupt, just like the people <laughs> Yeah, and, right? and have, I, have I summarized? Yeah. yeah, and my second question is to uh, Dr. Kate Orkin and, and Musi Mamen as well. That when you say a fragile state of South Africa, which is South Africa, what, what would you, uh, do you mean because of the corruption and the people, less people are showing up at the polling booths? Is it because of that? Or do you think it's susceptible in future, in coming years, to getting authoritarianism? Getting, sorry? Uh, authoritarianism. Authoritarianism. Yeah. So I haven't quite understood the question, that we drift towards authoritarianism in South Africa. No, in terms of, like, when, when you say it's a fragile democracy. Yeah. Yes. So what you mean by fragile democracy? In That is in terms of corruption, being, uh, like, a lot yeah. of corruption in the country, or state getting benefited from the people you do business with. Is it because of that? Oh, is because or of is, 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 okay. is, is in yeah. future... Got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, maybe the, the gentleman there, in sort of in the middle, in sort of a Movis shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what Movis is? 
<laughs> um, this, yeah, I, um, Muzi, I, I have two questions for you, really. Um, the first is, I, I, in a funny sort of way, are you quite pleased that Jacob Zuma remains the president of the ANC <laughs> and hasn't fallen on his sword where if he was an honorable man, he would have, um, in that it, it sort of highlights his, um, what he is, and, and, and the fact that he, he uh, is so protected by the ANC and, and what that shows about the, the ANC itself. The second I is about tribalism, and, and are we seeing, and are you seeing in South Africa the perception that the ANC is becoming a, a very Zulu party um, as we're probably seeing in Shwani today. Um, is that perception something which you're seeing in provinces apart from KwaZulu-Natal? Okay, thank you. We're having, in, we're having question inflation because each question so far has been two. Let's have the gentleman down here. And then we'll... Yeah, hi there. Forward. My name's Gordon. Um, question I have is, is sort of along the lines of once uh, you have the elections, whatever year it is and you actually do win for once what says that suddenly what's happening in Swanee at the moment ultimately is if the ANC is not happy with its own people they're certainly not going to be happy if another party gets in control of the government what is in place that stops that and uh, yeah, your opinions on that please sure. okay some very interesting questions there maybe you can give us Fairly short answer, so we can do another round. Yeah, I'll try my best. I mean, the statement about being liberated from the liberators is about people understanding that in a democratic choice, that it mustn't be a contestation of people, but it's a contestation of ideas and ideals. And therein lies the maturation of democracy, is that you can't I mean, even today, still the ANC wants to use the famous phrase, do it for Mandela. And I, I mean, Mandela is a personal hero. But he has, since he's passed away, would be very cap incapable of governing. Do you know what I mean? And, and that sounds... <laughs> but what's critical about that is, is that we've got to get to a point where people assess leaders for what they're doing in the current space without trying to resurrect a historical narrative about where people have come from. And that's an important bit about not people being liberated from the liberators. To not assume deity amongst those who are liberators, but to actually hold governments to account in that regard. So, and it's a question of putting new governments in place, making sure those governments deliver. Uh, I think your second question, I'll perhaps maybe allow Kate to comment a lot more on. And my point about fragility actually speaks to what happens often in many African democracies where if you erode the institutions enough, it's not that those countries aren't holding elections. But it's a bit like in Zimbabwe when you look at the voters' role and, and you realize that dead people are voting. <laughs> now there is an election but it's a compromised electoral commission. And it is the same in many African countries where even the media, we're seeing it in South Africa now, where the head of the, the state, the public broadcaster, is effectively turning it into a state broadcaster, where ultimately opposition parties are getting less and less coverage in that space. That's another way of undermining the very essence of that institution and its ability for voters to be able to communicate to people at home. So these are crucial things to ensure that democracy functions. Its most powerful endpoint is, of course, at the ballot box, but institutional democracy along the way is absolutely cru crucial for why a nation must <coughs> succeed. And that's why I say, if you undermine the institution, you put democracy in a very fragile space. The, the second question about whether I think it's good for Jacob Zuma to remain, uh, we often joke and say sometimes I'd like to give Jacob Zuma the long serving award at our next Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob Zuma is a symptom 
of the cancerous nature of the ANC as far as corruption is concerned. So I think often we like to say, let's separate Zuma from the ANC, but it can't be. It's what Thabo Mbeki called the organization. He said, this great movement will become a parasitic, ignoble organization. And I think now the chorus has shifted away from Zuma must fall to becoming one of saying the ANC must fall. That's why in parliament the ANC will vote to defend Jacob Zuma. Because as I think it was Tim Cohen who described it as a neo-patrimonial organization where the whole organization is captured for the purpose of patronage. So you ask me whether I think Zuma must stay. I think if Zuma was to be removed from the ANC, it would destabilize the entire organization because he's captured it so significantly. When people in South Africa talk about state capture, they tend to assume it's the Guptas or whatever the Leeson scandal is. In truth, it's not. The Guptas have captured Jacob Zuma, who in turn has captured the state. And so it must be a removal of the whole if you are going to deal with real transformation. And that's why I am convinced the ANC is irredeemable and no leader who will rise up within the ANC is able to rescue it from himself. So at this point in time, Zuma becomes the flag really for deep and chronic corruption that's taking place. The question about tribalization and all of that, look, I don't think it's as prevalent as what it is. It's not born. Yes, KZN is a variable, it's a factor. I don't necessarily would think you could sustain the point that the ANC is a Zulu party or that. I think historically that was the case. I don't think it's the case now. I think the ANC now, I mean, patronage is the order of the language of the day. So I don't. Yes, we have other problems of race in the country, but I think, in fact, the ANC, at this point in time, the only, I would say, the only reason why Zulus still have a much bigger voice is that KZN, as a component of delegates going to the ANC's Congress to elect a leader, still have a bigger say. But it is, it is a function of where, which province they come from, rather than a function of which language they speak, because Zulus and Gauteng may hold a totally different view to Jacob Zuma. So I, I, I really do think it's becoming less and less so and becoming a question of what is the pragmatic exercise of whichever leader to stay in power. Um, and then I think... Yeah, your own security will say. How, how, will you, how will you stay alive if you actually become more successful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an important no, question, isn't it? The, when we took over Cape Town, the first eight months were difficult. Very, very difficult. Because, yeah, the true test of democracy is whether when the party loses power, it will surrender it. That's the test. In many ways, we could say it's been the successful holding of elections. Yeah, that you can do. Zimbabwe has elections. But the test here is whether or not you can surrender power. So, yes, we must be up against the fight. For me, the optimism is that the judiciary still remains fairly resol resolute and resilient, which means that you could be able to form the very checks and balances with the bits that remain. And I actually do think pragmatically over a long period of time, the transition in South Africa may take at a national level a composition of different parties. And if that had to do that, then you were able to command a much broader consensus of people to be able to ensure that those whose interests are to destabilize the state remain in truth in the minority vis-a-vis -vis being in the majority. So I think if we were to take over national government, it would take a different, com I mean, I think nations like Venezuela show the fact that transitions take place and sometimes you have coalition governments that come into play. When they do that, they have then the consensus of many people in that nation. I think as South Africa's prospects is that people are coming on board and I think yeah you've got to fight for the first number of months because it's not a straightforward thing the bureaucracy has had cadres who come from the ANC so often it becomes about job losses for those people but you've got to keep understanding that that's why this that's why I wanted to speak tonight extensively about the role of institutional democracy and building that capable state so that any transition in government 
doesn't follow that you've got to replace the entire state, that you just replace the political party in charge and with another one. I had a question for you, actually. Uh, did you? Yeah, I, I don't think you've fully asked the one about how will you stop yourself being corrupted. Oh, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I also wondered whether that had anything to do with the issue of you being trained as a pastor, which was very <laughs> much absent from your presentation. Look, the reality of how you keep... One of the things that keep anybody from being corrupted is that they must fear voters. If you don't fear voters, you have no reason to not become corrupt. And from my point of departure is that A, the DA is quite deliberate about separating party and state so that you don't weaken institutions by pulling people from your own party to protect you. That's the first thing. The second thing is we've got legislation that makes sure that you can't do business with the very state that you are in charge of. Mm -hmm. So I would be breaking that first law before we get to corruption. Thirdly, and I think it is the point, if you feared voters and you understood that any semblance or any form of corruption would result in them voting you out, I think your behavior and your position towards them changes. And we've seen that successfully in the metros that we've governed in, in Cape Town and the mayors that we've elected there, they all understood that they fear the voters, therefore there can be no room for corruption. But also personally, it's a personal conviction. I have seen the devastating effects of corruption. It empowers the few at the expense of the many. And yes, I can't sit here today and say, given the excess of power, that power does not corrupt. But I think the most crucial thing is to subject yourself to institutional democracy. And that even sometimes when you say, there are things in our own party I wish I could do, because I'm the leader of the party, I wish I could just, at the strike of a pen, say, that person must do this and that person must do that. I wish it was so simple, but because even in the DA there's institutional democracy that makes sure that there are checks over me and its leader, that even though sometimes I don't agree with those institutions, I subject myself to that. So it's going to be critical that we institute the same model in government when we do, so that in fact my accountability does not lie to the party, it lies to the voters and the institutions put in, them in the state in this way. And what was your question? My question to you is, as one who studied much of African democracy, the role of the ICC, there was one of the things that happened in South Africa, was the fact that the courts found that the South African government had erred in allowing Omar al-Bashir to leave. Now, the ICC, South Africa is a signatory to it. Do you think, and often this is the accusation from the ANC, it's not mine, that the IEC is a racist organization, it's anti-Africa, and it must prosecute the apartheid government first before it can prosecute any other African leader. I'd be interested to find out from you whether, <laughs> what do you think of that? That could be a whole lecture, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, The, uh, the International Criminal Court came into being because Africans, African governments, signed and ratified the statute. To a very large extent, despite all the rhetoric from the African Union, it's an African court, even has an African prosecutor. Most of the referrals to the International Criminal Court have, by, have been by African government. I mean, the Bashir case was from the Security Council, but most of them from African governments. So I would see it in a different way, maybe in a more, taking a more macro picture of things. I've worked in Central Africa, in, most in Central Africa, since 1980, a very long time, and I've seen some really terrible things. I would say, actually, far worse things that ever happened in your country. Mm. Vast numbers of people being slaughtered and nobody cared. And the criminal court has brought the gaze of the world to Africa in a way that was inconceivable before <laughs> the Rome Statute Agreement came into force. And for me, that is hugely positive. It's not about you know, a white perspective on justice or a neo-colonial perspective. It's about treating all Africans as human beings. And for me, that's a line in the sand that is really valuable. Questions? 
<laughs> Let's go around this way. No, we have to go this way then. Maybe up that side. Um, everybody's in blue shirts. What is it about blue shirts? <laughs> the um, yes, the man there with a hand very high in the air. Thanks very much. Uh, it's Stuart Theobald. Um, I'm a columnist in Business Day and uh, a doctoral student here. Um, I, I was interested in Dr. Orkin's point on the liberalism versus social democratic ideologies and characterizing the DA as a liberal party, which I'm never quite sure because I don't know what the party's position on gay marriage or the death penalty is. Um, but the social democratic angle, I think, is interesting. And, and, and one of the reasons I think the DA has struggled to get traction in the black urban uh, voter populace is its confused messaging about black economic empowerment as a social idea and redistribution and, in some ways, retribution that characterizes that as an ANC policy. And the DA seems to be confused in its messaging around black economic empowerment. And I wonder if you could put it straight for us tonight. Okay, let's take a couple more. We're a bit pressed for time. I think I want a woman. We've got all men in blue shirts with their <laughs> hands. Oh, yes. We've got one right down the front here. Let's have the one right down the front here. Hello. Um, I want to ask, um, where do you get your, to you, um, Musi, where do you get your economic theory from or your political theory from? Because as you mentioned, I know it was just like a joke, like why nations fell. And you got your like, you mentioned why nations fell, the book. Yeah. And that talks about insti um, institutions and that's a big thing in um, economic theory right now. To what degree are we using institutions as a supplement or to, as a blame or escape um, from human agency? Because institutions do not run themselves. There should be a point where even if institutions were to operate, that even if only the elite were in control, that they will have some sort of moral conduct or understanding of the way society is or, the, or lesser people. Hence why people in the rural areas that um, she brought up, whether or not they're gonna come out and vote in masses or not, why is it until they vote in masses that people who wanna run recognize, recognize who they are or recognize um, what they want from government. So basically what my question is, is that do you believe that the understanding of institutions is, over, is overplayed? It's actually human beings that are running institutions, that are sustaining institutions, that are making institutions flourish. Institutions itself cannot actually make people fail. It's the person behind it. So I'm just wondering whether, yeah, do you, are, you, are we blaming human beings or? Yeah, so that's basically what I was yeah, Interesting question. Right, one more question. Uh, am I, gonna do? I want another woman. Yes, the lady in red. Hi, um, this is for uh, Mamusi. Um, I'm from Cape Town, and I've recently been back for three months, um, spending time in South Africa, traveling around. Now, myself and my husband, we support um, a school in Claremont, and you spoke about education and about young people and one of, the, one of the things we found was that, um, speaking to teachers and schools, was that the government has actually cut the um, education, um, the fees, the subsidies, yeah, <laughs> thank you, um, to schools. And in this particular school as well, um, which was a high school that where they basically trained students, you know, bricklaying, uh, motor mechanics, hairdressing and stuff, that we support, we kind of felt that there was a need for young people after they've left school, you know, it's good that they've got a skill, but what is the government, I mean, knowing that the DA has won the Cape Town, Cape Town a few times now, is that should you not have used Cape Town as a, as a step, you know, as, a, as an example to show what we are doing in Cape Town, we can do for the rest of the country, i.e. jobs, education, you know, um, young people, especially, you know, because they're the future of tomorrow, and my heart's really for young people, is what are you, you there hasn't, especially job creation um, back in Cape Town, it seems to be a really, really big thing, and, uh, and young people are going into gangsters because there's no way out for them, there's nothing for them to do. Even setting up institutions back home for youth, um, you know, where they are struggling to get money, you know, from governments and stuff. You know, so with the DA being the front head for Cape Town, I would have thought that maybe you would have used that as an example, as a stepping stone for the rest of South Africa to, sh to show, you know, this is what we're doing and this is what we can do for the rest of you. And um, so, yeah. 
Right, I think we're going to have to have that as the last question for the time being. Probably we're going to have to, we're at 8 o'clock already, and we're all very hot. So rather than asking you to respond, Kate, do you want to say anything here? You had a question that was sort of posed to you. Do you want to sum up everything so far? No. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there was one, though. Yeah. Um, so you asked, um, you know, do I, do I think South Africa is a fragile democracy? I would say absolutely not. Um, I think it's one of the strongest democracies on the continent, and yeah, that, my work definitely shows that. I was looking at one of the front pages of the newspapers, and there, there are two big issues going on in South Africa at the moment. The one is that there's finally been a resolution um, to a court case where, um, you know, some concerned independent candidates um, took the Electoral Commission and some others to court. The fact was that you know there was a process, there was a dispute over an election, and it was resolved peacefully. The the court came down with a verdict, and everyone has agreed. The other th big story is that um, you know people are fighting within the ANC about whether or not the candidate lists for the current election are being made public, and so people at the grassroots have said to the party, these lists must be made public. You know we care about the electoral process. We're really bought into it, and we want it to happen more fairly. Those two examples say it all to me. Um, we are becoming a mature democracy, and we need to be proud of that, um, you know, and to, and to move forward in that spirit. Thank you. Now, we have a, we've gone over time, but I think you ought to sum everything up and lead us forward to the future. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> Remain. <laughs> Look, I, I think there, there are some very important questions. I think the first question that you put, I think we come from a very strong liberal tradition upheld on the rule of law, the rights of individuals. I don't think there's ambiguity in the party about the rights of gay people. It's not even something we put up to a, to a choice vote. It's something that is enshrined in our constitution. And so there's no debate about the issue. I, uh, I think it's something that is upheld. I think your second question really about triple B double E <coughs> is that there's no debate in the organization about the need for redress. There's no debate in the organization that still today the proxy for disadvantage is still race. And I made the point quite clear, the face of poverty still remains black. There's no debate about that. So if you're going to then attend to that, is that if you're going to go, one of the things that we did when we went to Congress last year is we adopted values. And we said the values of the organization must be based on freedom, fairness, and opportunity. The second conversation about fairness is an acknowledgement of the fact that South Africa is still largely unfair on the basis of race. So there's no, I don't think anybody in the DA, it's been a lot of work in the last year, there's no debate about it. The second point to that is what do we then do with triple B, double E, is that of course we're supportive of it, and we have a proposed scorecard that seeks to achieve broad-based, not narrow-based, as the ANC wants to put it forward. So on a broad-based score is that we've said, yes, there must be a component of ownership and equity. There's a debate, there's a conversation about nobody's questioning that. But there must be the, this dynamic of saying, how can it be broad-based? So when the ANC tabled legislation in Parliament that said, we must move away from labor schemes as beneficiaries towards a narrow-based form of broad-based empowerment and say, let these individuals who are politically connected be the key benefactor, when you stand up and you say, that can't be so, because we want for South Africans to be the owners of, of empowerment and, and an inclusive economy, people say you oppose BEE, but it's not. We oppose it being captured by a few individuals who are politically connected for narrow interests. So yeah, it's been a project that we've had to do. And of course, along with that, we give points allocated towards how do you do enterprise development. But I want to push the envelope even more. I'm making the statement to say, how can it be? Can we think about BE also if we want to benefit beneficiaries on the ground by saying to them, why don't we link the score, the points, 
towards saying, give points to a company who sets up educational facilities in communities. Because what you would then do is that you would say, if company X, who say we want to qualify for triple BWE, set up a school in a community, fund it, they should get points for that because that achieves the very broad-based exercise I want us to get into. That, to me, starts to speak broader into a transformative agenda in an area of desperate needs in South Africa, such as education, and actually stops it being a transaction between a few people, and to which what's happened in the last year in the implementation of the legislation is that black and white have benefited almost equally on the basis of triple BWE. So I'm asking the fundamental question, why don't we mature it and put it in communities so that more people can be benefactors, so that we can put educational facilities in those places? So I think Jordan, who is here, my colleague, works, in fact, on, will be rewriting and making our offer on the basis of what are the broad scorecards that we can put on the table. And Jordan is really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying, if you, you're in, you're in. Uh, look, I think your question is, is, is important. Uh, I, I don't think there's a too much of a trumping of institutions. It's the very essence of the organization of the state requires institutional democracy. I don't think that anybody's sitting suggesting that there's an, there's perhaps maybe an overemphasis over and above the power of human agency. I made the point that leadership recognizes the fact that the best way to hollow out institutions <laughs> is to deploy individuals to those institutions that don't do the job. So when we think about South Africa's history, we've had a number of public protectors. We had a public protector in Lawrence Moshwana who you could even send him the documents for corruption and he didn't investigate it. And then you had a public protector such as Tuli Matonsela, who's gone ahead and investigated the case for the Nganda case against the president. So the office of the public protector or the institution of the public protector has existed, but it's taken two individuals literally to take different postures in both those institutions. So yes, I agree with you completely that individuals who put in those institutions agree, and I think Max Weber would agree in institutional capacity. And yes, you must send, the, the, the error that South Africa did is to adopt a policy position by the ANC called CADA deployment, which meant that you could hollow out those institutions by deploying people whose first loyalty was to the party rather than to the state or to the people of the country. So to sum up, maybe my response to your question, is to say if you want to have a sustainable institutional democracy, there can be no doubt that building a capable state requires that you train up your bureaucrats so that they can sustain the state beyond any political turmoil that may take place. It's the success of nations that are on the rise is the fundamental issue. So we mustn't say to government, must work people who couldn't find work elsewhere, we must send our best to government. <coughs> Look, I think the comments really about Cape Town and where it sits, I mean, we invest a significant amount of focus in the development of young people. And particularly in poor schools, we've had to put a greater focus, particularly quintile five schools, which are generally for around for poor kids. The issue here is that Educational policy is a shared competency between the province and national government. There is a disbursement of funds that, that provinces have to simply respond to in this regard. So they get an allocation of a budget and then have to disperse it in that regard. I think when it comes to the question of opportunities, which is, I think, the point you are making, is that we're working hard at saying, how, that's why we were the only party that fought for a much better, much more focused youth weight subsidy that said we could give young people internship programs, subsidize their wage so that we can give them work experience. So that those very young people who are studying plumbing, being electricians, could be able to find work, the state could subsidize part of it, and we could be able to give them the work experience so that they can ultimately contribute to society. So yes, and where we have, we in fact, on the basis of the National Development Plan, modeled a part of it. We took on a few young people to say, how do we train you so that we give you opportunities so that you can prove the case to say, we can give you internship programs and then take it forward. But it can't just stop there. 
we must be able to create a conducive environment for micro-enterprise to thrive. So we then initiated a thing that said we want to move from red we want to move from red tape to red carpet. So at the very same young person that you are referring to, if they want to start their own business, they can be able to set up their micro-enterprise easily, quickly, and know that they'll have a government that will assist in, in helping them. So, so it's both and. I don't think it's an exclusion of one. The community of Claremont need to know that there are good educational institutions that can be linked to proper internship programs, but also how do we stimulate micro-enterprise in a better way, because to close, you said I asked, should give some leadership here, is to say the sustainability of South Africa, this is the project that for me is absolutely crucial, is that South Africa's had a heavy dependence on big business, historically. Now, the future cannot be to the exclusion of big business, but it must be about a greater stimulus towards micro-enterprise. We should rather lessen the rhetoric about five million jobs and intensify the conversation about the hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs who in the majority of them will be black just by nature of the fact that there's a population that says, that reflects that. And then you can put the appropriate venture capital, you can put the appropriate infrastructural development to make sure those businesses thrive. You can then ultimately make sure that you can break down big tenders that in some ways we're just going to be competed for by big business, you can break them down so that small businesses can be able to compete for those. And that ultimately you eradicate uh, corruption so that those businesses aren't just for the few politically connected, but that you really open opportunities for all. If you can philosophically get that through in South Africa, institutionally make sure that you can assist that, I really believe it will be revolutionary for the South African economy in a world where, in fact, we've got some great innovators and some great people who come to South Africa. And I think so the problem is not what's wrong with the South African people, it's what, at this current time, what's wrong with the South African leadership. And so as an African, I feel that there's a great prospect for us to be able to model what can happen in the continent, in a continent that faces the biggest opportunity for the globe. So I'm proud to be an African, and I believe that we can really get this exercise right if we make the right decisions now. I can't, I can't resist asking a final question. I was told, I was told that my, I got a note here saying that I should ask of the final question, what would you vote if you were British in the referendum? But you've told, you've told us, so I'm going to ask you a difficult question, partly linked to the fact that we have Nelson Mandela over there with an LSE baseball cap on. Nelson Mandela is reported to have said that if Steve Biko had lived, he would have been incorporated into the ANC. Would Nelson Mandela vote for you? <laughs> well, what would Nelson Mandela stand for? I don't believe this is a man who would stand for corruption. I don't believe this is a man who would, would stand for racial mobilization. I don't believe, and I actually believe, Nelson Mandela went to Davos, came back, and really articulated an economic policy that made it easier for markets to thrive. The only place where those values exist today are in the DA, no longer in the ANC. So I am convinced Nelson Mandela would vote for them. Thank you.